Southeast Asia is home to more than eight unicorns. Here today uh, to tell some of their stories, I'd like to welcome to the stage Christy Neo of Deal Street Asia and her panel of the Southeast Asian Edge. Please put your hands together. Thank you very much. Hello and a uh, very warm welcome to everyone here in the panel. So um, let's just start off. Southeast Asia is home to 11 unicorns, and the signs are pointing to even more growth driven by tech companies and startups. When will Southeast Asia mature from a promising regional market into the next big world economy? And as the US and China continue to get engaged in their long, drawn-out, bitter trade dispute, what does this spell for the region? I'm very pleased and honored to welcome my fellow panelists. Um, on the far end, we have Mr. Leslie from GIC. We've got Joel from Trax. We've got Santi from C, and Mr. Fadrin from Bugalapak. Thank you very much for joining us today. Yes. So let's just talk about the, the US trade dispute, right? We know that the near-term costs are going to be very costly. Um, you know, we've got companies that are shifting their factory bases, supply chains are shifting. Have policymakers fully embraced the reality of what this is going to mean for businesses? Maybe, Leslie, do you want to take this question? Sure. Um, well, thanks for uh, taking your lunch time to listen to us. <laughs> Let me give you one perspective. I, I think I would rephrase the question to say we have to accept the reality of what's happening in terms of trade tensions and deglobalization in general. And we have to accept the reality that it's a negative shock in the short term. Uh, but what happens in terms of how we respond to that shock and what happens over the long term is pretty much in our control. Uh, in the short term, I think there are many, many things policymakers can do to try and rever reverse the negative impact. So, for example, the Fed has started to try to loosen monetary policy, and many, many people in the markets expect interest rate cuts. Um, in Asia, many countries have fiscal room to expand their budget, and that can be a shock absorber. In the long term, actually, I think there are also many things countries can do in the region. Uh, most important of all is to be a counter, in my view, to this trend of deglobalization. In Asia, we, by and large, have been open. And if we continue to be open, I think we can overcome many of the long-term consequences of this trade tension. Hmm. Yeah, but, I mean, the ramifications are going to be huge, right? I mean, when you talk about shifting supply chains, mm -hmm. when you talk about shifting factories, it's, it's a lot more than just, oh, I'm going to plug this factory and just going to build another one there. It's, it's going to be a really long, drawn-out fair. Like, do you really think that policymakers have come to accept this reality that this is not something that's just going to happen and be overcome quickly? Santi, do you want to take this? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, um, I think if you are, you know, as a tech company, we take a long-term perspective on the region, right? And from that perspective, I like to say that ASEAN is really a region with a lot of hidden assets. There's just so much potential that hasn't really been fully unleashed and um, so much hidden assets that's to be explored and uncovered. And just to give you examples, you, you know, this is a region where SME, the uh, small medium scale enterprise, accounts for about 99% of enterprises, about 80% of employments, and yet most of them haven't actually gone through the process of digital transformation or really utilizing technologies yet. And you see that in uh, numbers like e-commerce penetration in region is about 2-3% of retail sales overall. That compares with like 20% in China. And that's just half of the story. Those are existing entrepreneurs. There's also new entrepreneurs coming to the market every day looking for opportunities. We did a research with the World Economic Forum where we surveyed about almost 50,000 youth in the region. And we found about a quarter of them by far number one job. They want to become business owners. They want to become entrepreneurs. So there's so much talent, there's so much passion that, that you could actually tap into. 
Um, and what you need, I think, technology will play an absolutely key role to really unleash your potential, giving them the tools to survive um, and to, to thrive in this digital economy. And when you look at that, um, and you look at the policymakers, yes, you know, they are coming together in, in different countries, have their own digital economy plan, they have e-commerce plan, then trying to support this, this, this industry, this sector, which is going to be very important in order to unleash the domestic potential and growth um, in, in the region. You did mention also earlier that, I mean, perhaps it, is it time to actually rethink mm. globalization, to mm. rethink you know, what this actually means? Because the pace of disruption is actually happening much faster than a lot of markets can actually cope. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's a very good question. I think one of the questions we, we should ask ourselves like going forward is that, you know, do we just want to focus on the quantity of growth or shall we shift more to the quality of growth as well, where each unit of GDP, each unit of economic growth benefit more people and is more inclusive? And I think, again, back to, I think technology has a key role to play in sort of bringing everyone into that ecosystem. Again, e-commerce, you know, we have seen examples whereby um, a, a small SME's, um, say, producer of fermented pickle fish from Thailand from in a small province can find be connected to the global markets just through initially explore e-commerce. Her sales went up more than 100%, 150% within less than a year, and then afterwards become exported to Australia, to Philippines. So, you know, when you look at all these trends and there's numerous cases like this, you see that actually, if you use technology right, you can bring about more inclusive economy and also reduce inequality while achieving growth. Okay, but when you say rethinking the model, like how is that actually going to look like? Because you have got qualitative and quantifying the kind of social impact which you're saying that we actually need to build. Um, I don't know if, do you have any thoughts on that? Is that something that, yeah. you know, is on um, SGIC maybe, perhaps? Yeah, we should include um, our real world <laughs> yeah, definitely. colleagues here too. And, um, but maybe I, I would add my two cents um, before that. And, you know, we should remember globalization has been good for us in Asia. We would not be here today if it were not for globalization. And, and I, I do think Asians in general, we should be the sort of arguer for why being open is a good thing. We should, in today's world, this may be a message that is uh, being missed. At the same time, you know, the speed of change, the impact of technology has led to a lot of concern, lots of insecurities. So if you ask me what has to change, it's just us being more aware that even in technology, right, ultimately we have to assure people that their future is a good one, that their children's future is a good one, that by being open to ideas and to people, talent, we are not going to make them less secure or less of a citizen. Yeah. And that we will do this also in a sustainable manner, right? Both from a point of view of society, but also from an environmental point of view. Um, so lots of promise, lots of challenges. Technology is part of the solution. Um, but we have to be aware of the problems. We cannot wish those problems away. Mm. Yeah, but I mean, as an investor, so mm -hmm. the last yes. question before I go. <laughs> Our two unicorns. Um, I mean, as an investor, are, is GIC even thinking about trying to quantify and measure and make some of these startups actually accountable for some of the disruption that they're actually, you know, creating on society? Because you talk about creating inclusive, you know, inclusivity, social equality. Mm. You're, as an investor, these are some yes. of the things that you do need to ensure that your portfolio companies abide by. Yep. You know, and also, how do you actually quantify that? And then we can go on to the two of you. Like, are you actually getting this from investors as well in terms of the kind of impact that you're making in Indonesia? So, you first. So, I would make two points there. First point is, I, I think investors who are long-term in orientation, and that includes the GIC, but not just G GIC, pension funds, for example, other uh, family funds, uh, people who invest with a long horizon, have for years now become more and more uh, interested and concerned about making sure that their investments lead to sustainable behaviors, sustainable co companies. So sometimes we would say ESG, we would use the word sustainable inv investment, or we would say impact investment. I think that's a, a, an important 
sort of um, development that has been um, getting stronger and stronger over the last few years. Uh, for GIC itself, we are a long-term investor. We do care that we invest in companies that want to and seek to be sustainable. And we try and understand what that means, uh, because the meaning of that changes. Um, but it is our core. Right? We're not in for a quick buck. We want to invest in sustainable companies. Maybe Fajrin, you'd like to take, I mean, have your investors actually approached you in terms of, um, you know, ki making yourself accountable in terms of not just creating money, but also creating social impact? How do you actually draw the balance between the two? Yeah, so in fact, in our company, Bukalapak, we have this creating positive impact as really one of our main goals. Yeah. Not just because it's, you know, social jargon and stuff like that, but it actually makes sense for platform companies like, like, like us. Why? Because in the platform economy, like Bukalapak or other platforms, there is this concept called network effect, meaning that the more people joining your platform, then the more it will attract more people who have not joined the platform to join the platform. Meaning, if there is more merchant in Bukalapak, then supply and demand, the price will be more competitive. Yeah. Because the price competitive, then more people are buying from Bukalapak. As a result, the revenue of each merchant in Bukalapak is growing. Uh, and as a result, the merchants who are not joining the platform are attracted to join because they see that the merchants who are joining the platform is increasing in terms of the revenue, right? So for us, we're not just looking at the company's metrics, but we also look at the merchant's metrics as well because their success means our success or vice versa. If we want to be success, we have to make them success. But it's got to be a lot more than just the number of merchants and a number of clients that you're signing on. I mean, how do you, what yeah. is your measure of success? So not just the number of merchants, yeah. yes, but also average revenue per merchants, yeah. right? Because if the average revenue per merchants are increasing, then we can say that overall they become more uh, prosperous, each of the merchants. Uh, not just quantitatively, but also qualitatively, we can see that more merchants before, there are only one-man SMEs, for example, but more merchants are uh, trying to employ more people. We have merchants who have gone from one-man show into now employing five or ten people. Yeah. So that kind of impacts are really the fact that we are trying to solve in this market. So in 2017, for example, in 2018, we need to finalize the number, but in 2017, average revenue of merchants in Bukalapak actually increased three times compared to the year before. So that kind of impact, which is not only good socially, yeah. but also making Bukalapak uh, success as well. Okay. So a really important part of all this as well is also about encouraging entrepreneurship. It's about fostering the right kind of culture, the right kind of ecosystem that is conducive for people to say, I want to enter the business, I want to do something on my own. Um, are you able to relate? Because you've been, you've been an entrepreneur for some time. Um, how have things changed from the time that you started as a founder to Indonesia that, the Indonesia that you see now? Has it been easier? Has it been more challenging for people to, be, you know, to say, hey, I want to I start my own business? Definitely when we compare the situation into when we started around nine years ago, uh, in 2010, there was no ecosystem at all. We didn't know uh, how to start. We didn't know who to approach in terms of the investors and stuff like that. So we did bootstrap. We didn't know who to ask if we find difficult questions, technical questions, and so on and so forth. There is no uh, VC communities or other communities. There is no event like this. Um, but nowadays, uh, this, this, this situation are changing. A lot of people see that a lot of values are created from the industry and a lot of people want to help or want to join the ecosystem from the investor communities, from the academic institutions uh, who, whose talents are really needed in these industries. So right now in Indonesia and many other countries as well, I see that the entrepreneurship is flourishing to the point that it's actually the opposite. I now have a question. Is this hype or not? Is there a bubble of everyone is going to be entrepreneurs? Is there a bad effect on this? So I tried to sort of like uh, creating a break uh, when I speak to uh, all these new entrepreneurs, uh, communities or uh, students, for example, I usually uh, start by asking, who wants to be entrepreneurs? Everyone raised their hands. And then I tell them, 
the hard story about entrepreneurs. Yeah. You know what? 90% of entrepreneurs fail. Yeah. At the end of the se session, who wants to be entrepreneurs? Only half remains. Yeah. Now, I don't want to discourage people who become entrepreneurs. I just want to tell them that if you want to be entrepreneurs, you have to have a very good uh, problems that you want to solve. Not just because you want to, oh, you know what? I want to be like Fukuoka. You know what? I want to be like other unicorns. Because if you just follow you know, uh, the entrepreneurship path because you think that it's a shortcut for getting rich or being success, then when you find problems, it's difficult for you to solve. Okay, so what else is Bukalapak doing? I mean, in terms of, I mean, you also, you're kind of the hero of the, you know, there are a few heroes in Indonesia, you are not one of them, you know, being the unicorn. Um, is it about working more closely with the government? Is yeah. it about, you know, coming up with your own incubators, you know, education portals to educate the public? What needs to be done in the Indonesian ecosystem? So, uh, I, think, I think right now, because we have so many problems in Indonesia, it's actually also a good way uh, for entrepreneurship to start. Yeah. Because again, entrepreneurship is about creating the problems. So one of them is yes, we are discussing or uh, talking with governments a lot in terms of what we can collaborate. For example, talents is definitely one of the things that uh, is still a very, very challenging in Indonesia. A lot of people are trying to recruit talent from foreigners or from abroad as a result. So we're thinking, should we improve the curriculum for high school or university to include more tech uh, knowledge and skills so that we can fulfill the demand of the technology and other uh, type of partnership that uh, fortunately the government is really open to discuss in terms of this potential of this new industry in digital economy. So let's move on to tracks. I mean, hiring tech talent, scaling tech talent is, is a really important aspect of building you know, a tech-oriented business. Can you just share with us, I mean, how did you manage to, you know, in terms of hiring, in terms of scaling talent, actually, you have a pretty different approach compared to, to Bukalapak. Uh, yes, so uh, obviously in our space, which is heavily around computer vision and artificial intelligence, yeah. talent is a key factor for making a success. Uh, Trucks chose from day one to become global, and actually from the day we set the company in Singapore and founded it, uh, we actually set our R&D center in uh, Tel Aviv, in Israel, and opened subsidiaries in other jurisdictions and other parts of the world. Uh, so today, when we approach talent, uh, talent, we actually approach it on a global basis. Uh, we attract talent in the places where we can find it, and if needed, we are mobilizing our employees across the world. Uh, we have many employees that were sourced in the U.S. and currently working in Tel Aviv, uh, engineers from Tel Aviv working in China and in Singapore, uh, and that globality helps us to attract talent uh, in the places where those talents can be found and then utilizing them uh, in the places where we need them the most. Uh, maintaining talent is another big challenge, and I think that goes back to the culture you create in your own company. Obviously, you need an environment that uh, embraces the human talent as the key factor for success, um, and that also not only, only from culture and other perspectives relating to the human behavior between the company and employees, also in terms of making sure there is a full in incentives uh, for the success of the companies uh, to be shared with the employees in the form of wealth distribution of options uh, and other uh, monetary stakes of employees in the company. But you know, for Trax, you guys, when you started out, so as you mentioned that, you, know, you guys started with this vision that you're going to be a global company and you wanted the best tech talent, you wanted the best AI engineers. And to you, the best AI engineers were the ones that were based in Tel Aviv. Um, I believe you still think that is the same today, but do you think Southeast Asia can ever match up to the rest uh, of the I world? I think that uh, overall, uh, the talent in Southeast Asia uh, is growing very rapidly, both in terms of uh, the capacity, the number of people that are now educating in the universities around technology uh, um, uh, professionals, and also in terms of know-how is being florated into Asia, uh, Southeast Asia from China, from India, from Israel, from the US, from multiple uh, junctions. Uh, I think uh, some of the governments in Southeast Asia, specifically Singapore, are attracting global MNCs to come and be headquartered here, both in terms of research centers and other uh, headquarters functions. Uh, we can see lately coming into Singapore uh, uh, the likes of Microsoft, Google, Amazon, IBM, 
and that uh, forces these big companies are bringing with them a lot of know-how and training into local talents. And that what happened in Israel probably 20 years ago, and you see the results today. And I'm sure if you look 10 years from now in Southeast Asia, you would see a lot of local uh, entrepreneurs, local uh, professional talents that learned university, were educated in these global companies, and got a lot of talent and know-how around the cutting-edge technologies around the world. So back to Bukalapa, I mean, tech talent has always been an issue. It is still an issue today. Perhaps. It is, yes. <laughs> what, what are you doing to try to draw talent into Indonesia? So one, we are actually, I mean, short term, I guess, um, we, are, we, are, we are essentially open to anyone, uh, foreigners or Indonesians who previously work abroad, so Indonesians who previously work in companies like Google, Facebook, or other Silicon Valley companies. But in the long run, we are also thinking, can we also, besides helping the company, but also helping the country overall? That's why we have partnership, a lot of partnership with universities. So with the leading universities in Indonesia, like Institute of Technology Bandung, University of Indonesia, and others uh, in the form of internship, scholarship, and recently even we opened an artificial intelligence research center in Institute of Technology Bandung. That's what we do to supply or to fulfill the demand that is needed by the industry. Mm. Aside from that, uh, the regulators again, uh, we also provide a lot of uh, inputs to the government, the Ministry of Education, mm. regarding what sort of skills and uh, skill set that we need in the industry that potentially can be taught in the, in the, in the college. Okay. Um, so Jokowi as well just recently announced some uh, tax breaks, corporate, uh, yeah, corporate tax breaks, you know, incentives to actually revitalize um, the economy as well as entrepreneurship. I mean, yeah. How realistic should we be, do you think, about some of these? Um, I, believe, uh, I believe it's something that can be done because when we talk about the, the current presidency, the first term of President Jokowi, he always talked about infrastructure. It is his main, uh, one of his main focus. And we saw what happened with Indonesia. We, he, we see in infrastructure is improving. Maybe not like very good yet, but we see the improvement. We see more toll roads and other stuff like that. Now, uh, President Jokowi uh, clearly mentioned repeatedly that the focus for the next terms, for the second terms, aside from the infrastructure, is clearly talent. So this, is, this will be one of his focus. So anyone uh, who can cooperate with the government on this sector will potentially see a lot of impact or upside. Um, so that's why we're also interested to work together again with the government for the next terms. Yeah. Um, back to talent again. I mean, your R&D team is currently based in Indonesia. And I did ask this earlier. Um, and I'm going to ask this again for the benefit of our audience. Um, I mean, Bukalapa is growing massively. You're scaling really quick. Do you think you ever hit a stage where you're scaling so quick, you have to keep up with the exponential growth that you are not able to you know, be able to hire the talent internally within Indonesia and have to look elsewhere? Because I, I've always, from my reading of Bukalapa, you guys have always had this mission of being able to, you know, being really focused on nurturing your own talent, even taking you know, investors' money, invest, Indonesian investors' money, you know, as a way to really be able to spur the internal ecosystem. You know, do you, will you ever find yourself caught in that stage where you have to look elsewhere? I guess there is possibility. That's why uh, I said in the beginning that uh, we are open to such thing. Um, we are also exploring right now um, in opening offices in other countries. But that helps for the short term, right? So in the long term, I guess uh, what's good is to have the talent fulfilled by the local uh, talent itself because we have so many people in Indonesia. Uh, so yes, maybe in the short term, we potentially might hire people from abroad. But uh, in the long run, hopefully this demand will, uh, time by time, it will, be, it will essentially fulfill the demand. Mm. Let's go back to US and China, um, back to you. So, um, you know, you talk about Southeast Asia um, and, you know, this uh, deglobalization that is happening. Um, oh dear, I have to refer to my notes. <laughs> uh, okay, sorry, let's, let's go back to Jokowi, sorry. 
um, in terms of in terms of Jokowi and some of the things that he's you know he's proposing. You know, do you think we should be? How, people like to talk about this during election time. You know, how realistic should we be about some of the things that he's proposing? Do you think that you know he's you know getting ahead with some of the proposals that he's making, or do you think he's moving in the right direction? Um, yeah. Um, well, I, I think, uh, you know, maybe let me weigh a little bit more on the issue of digital skills as well, because it's so crucial for the, for the whole region, yeah. Indonesia and the whole region as well. And I think this is where our view is very strongly that, yes, it's very important for policymakers to make crucial steps, yeah. but we cannot rely and just say, you know, this is a job of the government alone. I think um, there's a role industry players have to play, like, you know, like ourselves, like Shopee, Garina, like Kalapak, with the governments as well as the universities to collaborate. Um, and in fact, um, on specifically on that point, last week we just announced uh, an initiative called a 10 in 10. Um, it's to celebrate a C's 10-year um, anniversary. Um, and um, the initiative is basically that we are committing to train 10 million people in this region over the next 10 years in terms of digital skills they need in order to thrive in the 21st century. And the reason we do that is precisely because we think this is one of the key um, challenge, but also the key opportunities for the region. And we think it's, it's an open platform you know, where part, different part of ecosystems can come together and work on this. Um, there are three key pillars. One is the, about the, um, creating future skills, where we work with universities that develop, develop curriculum, whether it's like e-sport management, game development, coding, um, scholarships, but another pillar which is very, very important as well is that we cannot forget about the current generations as well. It's not just about future generations. What about people like, well, myself? I consider myself, you know, probably not a, quite a million-dollar tech generation per se. How do we get them up to speed and use the current day technology? Um, train them uh, SMEs to go online, to go digital, to adopt e-commerce, e-payments, for example. And the third pillar is around building the bridge between academy and the industries. Because when it was changing so fast, what happens sometimes is what you study, whether it's data science or other things, um, is you know, you, you, you're, you're very strong academically, mm -hmm. but it stopped being relevant to the, in, what industry needs. Mm -hmm. And so we have initiative that we have done on Shopee side, like the Shopee National Data Science Competition Challenge um, that we've done in Singapore, one of the biggest ones, where we try to help people get trained, um, we provide uh, anonymized data sets and real-world problem challenges that we're facing as a platform and try to get people to come and work together, train and learn how to actually use coding to, uh, data science to actually solve the real-world problem. So you know, these are the three pillars and I think it's something that we need both the public sector and private sector to come together. But when you talk about education, infrastructure building, next question for you. I mean, these are things that take a really long time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do you think, you know, maybe perhaps we should be realistic in terms of the time that's going to take and the level of disruption that actually that's going to happen in the economy? You know, what, what do you think would be the worst case scenario? Is it that or is it about, you know, the kind of in wage inequality? Like, what, what should we be aware of? I guess what I worry about the most is that if we look at these changes and we say we don't like the change, we will go back in our shell. That to me is the biggest problem. Um, we have these challenges, we, we just have to deal with them. I, 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 that's reality. So I, 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 th I think one of the great things about Southeast Asia is that we have dealt with challenges in the past mm -hmm. and these are opportunities that we have to face. Um, Thinking fatalistic about them is not going not to get us anywhere. Hmm. OK. Um, another question as well, uh, Southeast Asia Tech. Do you think Southeast Asia Tech can ever compete with the US and China? Do they stand a chance against some of the big wigs? So maybe I'll, I'll be a bit facetious here. Uh, and if you don't mind, I'll tease you and say that's a very condescending question. Um, but it's an opportunity to explain why. There are 600 million people in Southeast Asia. Uh, there are many problems to be solved at the customer level, at the government level, at the business level. And I, I think US companies and Chinese companies will help us solve some of the problems. Local companies in partnership with US and Chinese companies will solve all their problems. Mm -hmm. But many local companies, many entrepreneurs will also solve those problems. 
Um, also, don't forget that uh, we call it U.S. tech, but one of the strengths of U.S. tech is that it's not just U.S., right? Who are the talent in the U.S.? Lots of Asians. Um, China may be not there yet, but they will soon have to have global talent. Why? Because in my view, um, solving many of the problems that we face in Southeast Asia is not just a technology question. Mm. It's a business, it's a problem, right? And it's about adding value. And in order to do that, it's a business problem, business model question. It's a question about implementing a business model, which I wouldn't trivialize. So for those reasons, um, you know, I, I think it's not the right framing to, to just think about who writes the latest paper in an academic and who's at the frontier. There are vast opportunities in Southeast Asia and local companies and entrepreneurs will solve those problems and tech is a great enabler for that. Hmm. Um, so the US and China again are also actually the big investors in this space. I mean, especially Chinese venture investors. So you guys are also invested by End Financial as well. Um, and interestingly, I mean, what I've noticed is that the US and China have actually taken very different approaches to, you know, kind of engage, spreading their technology and their influence over the region. Um, the US tends, like the Facebook and the Google and the WhatsApp, they tend to introduce their products directly into the market, whereas the Chinese somehow seem to be taking a little bit more implicit, so they tend to invest in companies like you guys, Boyu Capital also invested in you, um, as a way of being able to you know, influence and spread their tech across the region. How has Bukalapak been able to leverage upon you know, the, the expertise of, say, um, and financial for you guys? Um, yeah, definitely, when we partner with investors, we are looking not just uh, the fund, but also what other thing or what are the value add that they can bring. And Anu Financial being one of the investors definitely also help us a lot, especially in terms of the payments and other fintech solutions that maybe some of them we want to implement, right? So you're correct that uh, trade war is not ideal, uh, and then it's something that may be bad overall, but it's not all bad. Meaning that if we look at the silver lining, this can probably mean that China will potentially shift from the U.S. and look uh, for other regions to invest, and one of them is Southeast Asia. And similarly for the U.S. as well. U.S. will probably find, okay, what's, okay China, what's next? Uh, can we be the next China? So this is something that can be used or can be uh, applied by the Southeast Asian VCs and also startups, including ourselves, that it may be something that can be useful for us as well to engage with both parties at the moment before we're taking sides or something like that. Okay, last question for Trax. Um, so, use in China, I think it's not about choosing one over both, but you operate in both markets. How do you see this dynamic actually evolving? So, Trax is a global company and we need to walk between the lines, not to be caught up at any side of uh, this uh, dispute. I think one of the underlying notions is that the governments are realizing that while the information revolution brings a lot of opportunities and power, it's also uh, creating uh, a lot of, uh, may create a lot of confrontation and uh, a lot of negative power of control uh, of one country over the other. Uh, Trax is attracting investors from all over the world. We have U.S. investors, we have investors from Singapore, uh, we have uh, Chinese investors, um, and essentially we are uh, conscious to the fact that some of the technologies we adopt uh, may be controversial around computer vision, artificial intelligence, and trying to make sure that whatever ways we apply it will not contradict uh, any one of those uh, areas which might... Uh, which some governments might find uh, uh, as controversial. Okay. I think I've come to the end of the panel. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs>